So hello everyone and welcome to today's Talking Point webinar. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians on land in which we meet today and uh, Hamal Wurundji land, the Kulin Nation, pay respects to elders both past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people listening today or in the future. My name is Dan Ludburn, I'm the Executive Clean Director at Turning Point, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have uh, Professor Charles Livingston here today to talk to us around after the fall, what are the implications for gambling regulation and its reform in the aftermath of the Crown Star and other Royal Commission's inquiries? Will it be the business as usual? Uh, a really important topic uh, really something that we've seen in the media uh, frequently through the year, and obviously Charles has been a major contributor to that, and so we're delighted to have him here today. For those of you who aren't aware, Talking Point is a regular series of publicly available lectures that aim to inspire, inform, and challenge our notions of what we know about addiction and its impact on society. We like our webinars to be interactive as possible, so please ask questions via the Q&A function, which is on the bottom of your screen, We'll be collating those questions and we'll be asking uh, Charles to answer those questions at the end. Uh, please also be aware that our webinars are recorded and will be later made available on the Turning Point website. So if any of your colleagues have missed this, please uh, uh, encourage them to know that the webinar will be available at a later date and to check out the Turning Point website. So. Let me take this opportunity now to introduce our presenter. Uh, Charles Livingston is an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. He teaches health policy, sociology and politics in undergraduate and postgraduate programs, and he's head of the Gambling and Social Determinants Unit here at Monash. Charles has research degrees in economics and social theory. His research focuses critical gambling studies, including uh, gambling policy reform and the politics, regulation and social impacts of gambling. Charles, as you're aware, is a regular contributor to public debate via popular media, in particular around issues such as the social impact of gambling, the failure of the regulatory system to effectively constrain the excesses of the gambling industry, um, and how policy should respond to gambling harms. He is a current member of the WHO's expert group on gambling gambling disorder and the Lancet Public Health Commission on Gambling. He was also a member of the Australian Government's Ministerial Expert Advisory Group on Gambling from 2010 to 2012. So it's my great pleasure to invite Charles here today, and we're certainly looking forward to what his insights are around the implications of gambling reform in the aftermath of the Royal Commissions around Crown, Star and other inquiries. Over to you, Charles. Hi, um, great to be here and thanks for the opportunity to speak. So as Dan said, I'm talking today about after the fall. I think we can all agree that the last couple of years have been quite remarkable in the context of Australian gambling regulation in the sense that we've discovered that there pretty much hasn't been any. But what I want to talk about is what's going to happen next. We've seen what the downside is of uh, the, uh, the industry's essential ability to get away without being properly regulated. What we need to do now, I think, is to think about what's next. All right, so first and very importantly, I just want to share my disclosures with you. In the gambling research field, unfortunately, we still have quite a few researchers who take the view that it's okay to take money from the gambling industry. Um, and, and for that reason, I think it's very important that anyone who researches in this area is very clear about where their money comes from and what their are. Uh, so there's a few, um, there will be in case you're worried about, but, um, but uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see how we go. All right, so as you know, Australia is a land of gambling opportunities and it's also a wonderful land of gambling opportunities for operators. And it appears that we are somehow ordained to provide the gambling operators with the best available waterfront uh, land in order to develop their casinos. In the top left, we have Barangaroo, which was on a piece of land originally intended to be a public park on the Sydney foreshore. On the top right, we have Crown Casino in a site which was originally intended to be uh, the, uh, um, the site of the uh, new Museum of Victoria. 
On the left, we have the Queen's Wharf Casino, which is being erected so to, as we speak on the foreshores of Brisbane River in the middle of town and the Star, of course, which is on right on Darling Harbour as a key centre piece of a, uh, a major redevelopment of what, was used, what used to be a fairly uh, dismal docklands area. All right, so how did they come to this? How did they come undone? It's an interesting story because Crown had been the subject of rumours for many years. Anyone who was interested in the topic would have heard countless tales about money laundering, the infiltration of organised crime, um, high role of special services, including providing drugs, sex workers and whatever else these people wanted. Uh, the encouragement of risky gambling practices, that was perhaps the most obvious and least regulated aspect of any of it, and that's saying something. And of course, their commitment to the general exploitation of vulnerable people. So Crown was notorious for all of these things, but uh, the authorities seemed unable to act. So all of this came to a head in the mid 2010s when Andrew Wilkie established a service he called Pokey Leak. So this was a secure avenue for people who had information to come forward. And many indeed did. Whistleblowers, uh, perhaps not by the score, but certainly significant numbers of them came forward and offered their tidbits of information. And what those revelations were was that the rumours were in fact often factually based. And although these were published increasingly commonly in the press, the VCGLR, the Victorian regulator, did not do a great deal about it. They occasionally jumped on little things, but um, they, failed to, uh, they failed to investigate and, and they rarely took any serious action. However, in July 2019, The Age and the City Morning Herald and the Nine uh, television network published stories which linked Crown very carefully to organised crime, money laundering, and as they said, dodgy business partnerships. So this came about because in 2016, Crown's China employees, they had an office in Crown, Crown had an office in China, which was actively pursuing high rollers to move to Australia. Unfortunately, this was an egregious breach of the Chinese law because the Chinese at that time were having a crackdown on people who uh, were soliciting Chinese nationals to travel offshore to gamble. And of course, the Chinese government takes a dim view of this because many of these people, the high roller whale type people, are thought to be embezzling or um, otherwise misappropriating funds from Chinese corporations, particularly Chinese public corporations. And this reporting for the, in the most part, came about from the sort of whistleblower accounts that Wilkie and his team had been uh, accruing over a long period of time. So when it all came undone, uh, the reality was it wasn't the regulators that uh, investigated and saw what was amiss, but rather the press and of course the whistleblowers and others who'd been agitating for some time. Now, at the time all this was happening, Crown was building a new giant high roller casino and of course property development on Sydney Harbour on land which had been as I said originally earmarked for a public park. Um, now this construction had been mired in controversy from the start. There was no tender process and it was later revealed that the, uh, the initial approach was made by Mr Packer to the Premier of New South Wales at a private lunch hosted by Alan Jones, the radio host at Mr. Jones's fancy apartment on Circular Quay in the middle of Sydney. So Barangaroo, as I said, had initially been intended as a public park, um, and that itself was enough to cause much unrest, particularly uh, with the city of Sydney and others. But once it became clear that Crown was not only just very pushy and capable of getting governments to do whatever it wanted, uh, but were also uh, accused of substantial malfeasance, uh, then the scandal could not be suppressed. And the uh, Independent Liquor and Gaming Authority appointed um, a former judge, the Honourable Patricia Bergen, to conduct an inquiry, which began in August 2019. So Bergen found during the course of her inquiry that Crown was not a suitable person to operate the casino, which had at that point not yet opened. And this was because she had seen ample evidence of widespread instances of money laundering, which the casino had been facilitating, close associations with junket operators. Junket operators are those people who organise groups of high rollers to travel uh, with many substantial benefits to uh, international casinos. Uh, 
Uh, the junket operators are rewarded by taking a slice of the action, the betting action. But many of the junket operators, of course, were closely linked to organised crime. And the reason for this is that a junket is an extremely good way to launder money in large amounts. Crown had also been guilty of regional, uh, regular branches of breaches, rather, of gambling regulation. It had very poor managerial and governance practices. Uh, and uh, the Virgin Inquiry found it was uh, subject to excessive influence from the principal shareholder, Mr Packer, who stood down from the board but was apparently continually updated and briefed on information that was kept from the board. And it was updated and briefed by his uh, colleagues, comrades who had uh, stayed on in the company even after he'd stood down as a board member. So Bergen found that multiple amendments required to legislation in order to strengthen the powers of the regulator and indeed the capacity to impose penalties and that it was almost inevitable that junket operators should be prohibited. And as I say, junket operators, because of their links to organised crime, are always a weak link uh, and banning them is a bit of a no-brainer, really, but it hadn't happened before. But, of course, all of this malfeasance hadn't occurred in New South Wales. Crown did not have a casino operating in New South Wales at the time. All of it related to their operations in Melbourne and Perth. Crown, as many of you will know, operates a large casino in Melbourne and a smaller but nonetheless very profitable one in Perth. So. At this point, the Victorian government has said nothing to see here, but after the Bergen report was handed down in February 2021, the Victorian government announced a Royal Commission. And uh, the Finkelstein Royal Commission, named after the uh, Royal Commissioner, Ray Finkelstein, not only uh, confirmed what Bergen had found, but also uh, found widespread evidence that Crown had been exploiting vulnerable people running a grossly inadequate responsible service of gambling program, which had incidentally been developed by three of the world's leading protagonists of responsible gambling, um, that they'd avoided gambling tax, that they were guilty of intimidating and browbeating the regulator regularly, that they had evaded their anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing regulations, uh, and that they had facilitated fraud via China Union pay credit card transactions. So all in all, a fairly impressive catalogue of, uh, of errors. So here's a couple of quotes from uh, Mr. Finkelstein. At various points in his uh, inquiry, um, it became too much for him. He said, wherever I look, I see not just bad conduct, but illegal conduct, improper conduct, unacceptable conduct. And it permeates the whole organisation. He wasn't pulling his punches. And of particular interest to me was that Crown Melbourne had for years held itself out as having a world's best approach to problem gambling. Nothing, he said, can be further from the truth. And that had been obvious, obviously, to anyone who'd been paying attention, but it doesn't look like the regulator had, I think we can say. All right, so the next cab off the rank was the Star, a large casino in Sydney. This, the casino was, in fact, operating in Sydney and had been for 10 years or more at the time of all of this. So whistleblower accounts started to get into the press and the media started reporting them. An inquiry was implemented by the ILGA, ILGA using the senior counsel who had been uh, cooperating with uh, Commissioner Bergen in the first inquiry. Strangely enough, they found almost exactly the same conduct. Uh, money laundering, criminal links via the junket operators, very poor governments, very poor responsible service of gambling compliance, uh, and indeed, uh, Star so far holds the cake for fraudulent credit union transactions because the China Pay credit union system is explicit that it does not allow its card and its payments uh, to be used for gambling. But what the casinos were doing was uh, putting out invoices to these accounts which said that they were for accommodation and food, but which were in fact transferred to the gambling division as uh, chips. And they found that Star was not suitable. I'd, I think it uh, goes without saying that uh, all of these inquiries have found both Star and Crown to be unsuitable to hold licences. I'll talk about a little bit more about the consequences shortly. All right, so that then triggered another inquiry in Queensland, amazingly. Uh, I should add, in the meantime, there'd been an inquiry in Western Australia, which essentially echoed what had been found in Sydney and Melbourne, a bit more low key, although it did in fact have some fairly egregious uh, uh, findings. It found that 
the regulators staff in Western Australia had regularly socialised with their counterparts at the casino, um, <clears throat> indeed going on fishing trips with them and selling fishing boats to and from each other, uh, and that none of them saw any problem with this, that there was no apparent conflict of interest. One of the things that the Star and Queensland Inquiry found was that people who'd been barred from gambling in New South Wales were encouraged by the casino uh, to go and gamble in Brisbane or on the Gold Coast. All of these casino operators and their casino licensees were found unsuitable. Now, you've got to remember there's a whole bunch of corporate entities that operate these casinos, but all of them were found to be unsuitable. Wow. So what were the consequences of this? Well, in New South Wales, uh, Virgin recommended a beefing up of casino regulation, and that occurred. They have established a standalone casino regulator who is linked to the ILGA, but is a separate entity. They approved significant new fines available, up to $100 million for each instance. They allowed the uh, regulatory authorities to appoint a special manager, someone who would take charge of the casino in the event that their licence was suspended or whatever. Star's licence in Sydney was in fact suspended for three months uh, and it was transferred to their special manager. But of course, Star keeps the revenue uh, and they imposed a $100 million fine. Uh, in Victoria, not dissimilar, the regulator was now limited uh, to gambling regulation. Previously, the VCGLR, the old regulator, had done both liquor and gambling regulation. It was uh, found that that was a big mistake and that they should be focused on gambling regulation only. There were new commissioners appointed, new powers and fines available in the same way as in New South Wales. These fines were up to $100 million. A special manager was appointed. Uh, the special manager in the Victorian case must, appoint, must report within two years to the new regulator. And if the regulator doesn't agree that they've met the standards, then their licence will be cancelled, apparently. Uh, and there were new powers for the regulator to investigate malfeasance. So they can uh, initiate inquiries, which they previously weren't able to. They can compel evidence and require the production of documents and so on, which they weren't previously able to do. All right, so there's a fair bit of uh, downstream consequences from this too. So Crown was fined $80 million by the Victorian regulator for its credit union fraud. Uh, it was fined $120 million for its, for its responsible service of gambling breaches, which is a record, absolutely. Star was fined $100 million in New South Wales and $100 million in Queensland. Interestingly enough, neither of the star fines adversely affected share price. When the New South Wales fine was announced and the suspension of the licence, the share price actually went up. Uh, and throughout the whole process, Crown was being subject to a takeover uh, by Blackstone, one of the world's largest private equity funds. Crown's now taken over. Blackstone did not blink at the prospect of forking out uh, $200 million worth of fines. But a couple of interesting developments in both states and in Queensland, the casinos will now move to a cashless system. That it was a recommendation of Finkelstein, which was agreed to by the parties, by the casinos. So that means that they, uh, they won't be able to accept big bags full of money anymore. Not that they ever were, but it's a much more explicit system. Uh, in the case of poker machines, Finkelstein recommended strongly that these have limits set by the customer and that he also recommended some sort of statutory upper limit, although he didn't just specify what that should be. So in essence, what they have to do is implement a pre-commitment system in the casinos. Uh, and in order to combat money laundering, funds must be transferred to and from a legitimate account. Uh, and at the casino in Victoria, compulsory breaks in gambling activity are now required for the first time. They had previously been subject to their code of conduct, but as we know, that was pretty much ignored even to the extent that it might have achieved anything. Uh, and subsequently, we've seen uh, the New South Wales Crime Commission undertake an inquiry into money laundering uh, via EGMs, by poker machines in clubs and pubs, which found that uh, widespread money laundering featuring billions of dollars every year was being uh, taking place in clubs and pubs throughout New South Wales, particularly in clubs. And Austrac has commenced federal court proceedings against Sky City in Adelaide uh, because of their egregious breaches of anti-money laundering regulation. Wow, you'd think, why aren't they all shut down? Well, what happens next? So these were unprecedented revelations at an official level. I mean, they've all, as I say, came from the media, but once they had a look, it was like lifting a rock and finding 
some very unpleasant truths at the bottom of it. It's no longer easy to ignore these. It, it was a time when these sorts of revelations were swept under the carpet because they were given, not given much prominence, but that seems for whatever reason to have changed. What we've also seen is that quite independently of this process, Tasmania has announced that it will introduce a full pre-commitment system by 2024. Um, this was a great shock to everyone, including me. I didn't see it coming. Uh, neither did anyone down there, in fact. Uh, and the industry went ballistic, naturally. They uh, thought they'd been betrayed by the Liberal Party, who they thought were in their pocket. As I say, the gambling industry was unimpressed with all of this. And we're now experiencing a debate in New South Wales over what they're calling cashless gaming. Now, of course, cashless gaming can be anything you want it to be. I think Clubs New South Wales' preferred model for cashless gaming would be tapping your phone against the machine in order to download the contents of your bank account into theirs. But if it's done properly, it should involve a pre-commitment system with reasonably uh, strong limits in place, which can't be readily changed. So this is what we're looking at in the current situation. There's a bit of an imbroglio brewing and it's going to be an interesting couple of years to go. So what are we talking about here? Now, you know, I'm focused largely on pokies. Most revenue in Australian casinos goes through the pokies. At Crown, it's well over half. In Tasmania, the revenue that the casino generates is about 92% generated by poker machines. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the revenue generated outside casinos by poker machines, it's quite spectacular. Um, New South Wales is on track for 7 billion this year. Victoria is on track for 3 billion. Queensland just beneath that. South Australia and so on. You can read all those numbers yourself, but it adds up to a sizable amount of money. As we know, EGM revenue, pokey revenue, the amount of money that people lost climbed sharply after the pandemic restrictions were lifted for whatever reason. I guess people wanted to get out and about again. Uh, but uh, what had been happening over the last few years is that pokey revenue had plateaued. Uh, but what we've found in the recent past is with the lifting of, of restrictions, that's really uh, skyrocketed. It has gone rapidly north. We can also know that online wagering is worth more than $7 billion per annum, perhaps closer to eight by now. Uh, that, of course, took off big time during the pandemic when so many venues were closed and people Many people who previously been gamblers turned to online gambling. Not all of them, but some did. Uh, that was growing at about 30% a year through the years of the pandemic restrictions. So there's billions of reasons for gambling operators to fight reform. The question is, can they do so successfully in the current uh, environment? And I guess I'd say gambling harm is much better understood, thanks to a lot of work by a lot of academics and a lot of others, we now have a much better grasp of the nature of gambling harm. In the past, um, it was dismissed as simply problem gambling, which affected only the affected gambler. Uh, and, you know, that it was just a, a tax on the stupid, as many people say. Uh, there was no big deal. It just involved money. But, of course, we now know that gambling harm involves, you know, many sequelae, including considerable harm to families uh, and other individuals. So... I think most people now have understood that message, or many people certainly have. Um, the revelations of widespread money laundering don't exactly enhance the reputation of this industry. Uh, this is a still, the picture here is a still from an ABC News report, uh, which shows bags, bags full of money. These, I think this is an Aldi freezer bag, which was literally choked full of $100 notes, which was being handed over in a darkened room at Crown. Uh, to be used for gambling, or in fact, almost certainly used for money laundering. Now, the casinos have had little choice but to do what they've been told to do in the wake of their malfeasance, although Star um, has put up a lot of resistance to doing anything like the right amount of uh, work. They initially even resisted doing a root and branch evaluation of where it had all gone wrong, although I understand that that's now being taken over by the special manager that's been appointed in Queensland. But there are now multiple reform options that we have, which have been, I think, crystallised and in the public and political mind. We can see an example of that in New South Wales, where the current Premier uh, has <coughs> announced he's um, supportive of a pre-commitment system. So he wants a pre-commitment system which will be linked to a cashless gambling system. In many jurisdictions, we're seeing... <coughs> oh, excuse me. We're seeing reductions in EGM numbers, the ACT in particular, but 
over time, the take in Victoria has declined proportionally compared to other states because we haven't expanded the number of pokies here since the early 1990s. Um, so at, on a per capita basis, we have fewer machines than ever. There's an argument for reduced accessibility, that is shutting these down, things down at particular times of night. We're looking at advertising prohibitions or more significant restrictions for the online bookies. And almost in every, in, in almost every jurisdiction, we have seen increased powers and political support for regulators. An important point to make that one of the reasons the regulators didn't pick up on any of this is because many politicians did not encourage them to do that. Many still don't. Uh, we can see many politicians in New South Wales who think that um, the poker machine <coughs> venues in that state should be left alone to keep doing what they're doing. Um, in fact, Mr. Peritot, the Premier, is fighting a sort of a one-man battle at the moment to overcome that resistance from many of the political operators. So what I would argue is that we're seeing a process of incremental reform. Now, that's not to say it hasn't happened in the past. Um, we've seen reductions in maximum bets. We've seen reductions in bet limits and so on, load up limits and so on in poker machines. We've seen increased regulation, particularly consumer um, protection legislation in the online gambling sector. So it wouldn't be wrong to say we've never seen any reform in this sector. I think it's reasonable to say it has been too little and too late, but it does appear to be gathering pace at the moment. So we're looking at uh, one click self exclusion for online wagering, which is called bet stop. That's apparently close. The industry has been resisting that, but I'm told that the Australian government is about to finalize that process. There's almost certainly likely to be a recommendation from the current committee in the House of Representatives to reduce advertising and perhaps prohibit it over time. As I say, the Tasmanian government is proceeding to implement a pre-commitment system by 2024. Um, and interestingly enough, the ability to implement that was a condition for the tender for the new monitoring operator in Tasmania. The Tasmanians have gone to a licensing regime in which the license will for the first time be held by individual venues as opposed to a single company. Uh, and as a consequence of that, it's necessary for them to put in place a new monitoring operator. And that monitoring operator had to give an undertaking that it would be capable of implementing a pre-commitment system if it was required. So the Libs have proposed cashless gaming in New South Wales, but the ALP at this stage doesn't endorse it. <laughs> Further opportunities for political donations reform, which have been gathering speed at the moment. And the National Anti-Corruption Commission might indeed have a role in reducing opportunities for political capture. We can live in hope. And I think it's true to say that there is much more widespread public disgust with this business in this point in time, which is perhaps powering uh, some of this increased activity and the likelihood of it being implemented. But no casino is shut at doors, even when their license has been suspended, as the star in New South Wales and Queensland. So in New South Wales, as I said, their license was suspended for three months, but simply handed to their special manager, who is continuing to operate as business as usual. Nobody's been charged with offences, although ASIC did um, announce 11 civil prosecutions today, breaching corporate regulation because of the inactivity of board members and the malfeasance of uh, executive staff. The pokey operators in New South Wales in particular are mounting a significant campaign against reform and they have very significant resources. And unfortunately, many politicians remain spooked by the clubs and pubs, including, as I see here, the New South Wales Labor Party, which has um, been captured by the uh, well, fully captured by the gambling industry since at least 2010 and probably longer than that. All right, so I think the lesson to learn from all of this is that tobacco reform took about 50 years. I think we're doing a little bit better than that in the gambling sector. Gambling reform is moving quite fast at the moment. And sadly, that's not because the states and the regulators have been focused on improving integrity and promoting harm prevention and harm minimisation, but rather because um, Campaigners, whistleblowers, um, some important politicians, Andrew Wilkie, for example, public health researchers and the media have lifted the rock to see what's underneath. And once you've exposed that rock, it's a very difficult thing to put back down again. And this has been in spite of the fact that we have politicians who in many cases have bent over backwards 
to protect the gambling industry and nobbled regulators at every turn. And of course, um, the love of politicians for the gambling industry um, is largely dependent upon their generosity in terms of political donations and so on. Uh, and of course, the uh, ability of the industry to attack uh, those people who it regards as its opponents, which politicians are not very keen on. And I think the message that comes out of this from, for me is that public health is a fundamentally political activity. Whether we like it or not, promoting public health reallocates resources away from private interests towards the common good. And that always triggers a reaction, whether it's gambling, whether it's clean water and sanitation in the 19th century, uh, whether it was uh, you know, action on guns, uh, whether it was anti-tobacco, anything that uh, takes somebody's resources away from them is likely to trigger a strong reaction. So what I'm saying is that I think over the next little while, we're going to see some significant pressure towards fundamental reform. Whether we can achieve that, um, is a function of how well we are able to respond to the criticism and the political campaigning of the gambling industry uh, and how well we can demonstrate that public health has a capacity to argue strenuously for the public good. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Charles. A fascinating presentation. Uh, if people want to put their questions in the Q and A, um, we can start going those through, through those with Charles. Um, I might start with um, a couple of questions. I, I suppose um, I think Charles, you know, what we're seeing, as you say, at the moment is is um, an unbelievable coverage, aren't we, in terms of stories in the media? So it, it, it seems like. Um, there doesn't a day go past where there isn't a, another gambling story in the media. And I think that's, I think maybe if you can comment on sort of, because obviously you've been working in this space for a long time and um, um, it seems like this whole area has got much more traction than it ever did. And it, it feels in some ways that um, the government's going to be shamed into do something uh, by the public as opposed to sort of taking proactive action. So yeah, just, just based on sort of, you know, you've covered this a bit, but in terms of your thoughts on, um, you know, what is driving this momentum in the public? You know, have, have we captured the public eye or is, it, is the focus more on online gambling than pokies? And uh, what, what, where do you see sort of change happening? Well, the focus, the focus depends on where you're looking. I mean, if, if you're looking at the Australian government's interests and priorities, it's online gambling, no question of that. But that makes sense. I mean, the Labor Party got burned very badly the last time it uh, tried to implement a uh, pokey pre-commitment scheme and I think they don't want to buy into an argument they don't need to have. On the other hand, the, premier, the previous Liberal government actually took solid steps towards implementing a good consumer protection framework. I mean, it's far from perfect, but it has made some significant steps towards helping uh, to rein in some of the greater excesses of the online gambling sector. And the current government has picked that up and is continuing with it reasonably industriously. They've just implemented new messaging, as I'm sure you're aware, on gambling advertising, which is going to come into effect from next year. Uh, they have announced that they're expediting the uh, one-stop shop for self-exclusion, which is an important step. Uh, and my understanding is that they're open to uh, new uh, strategies and uh, interventions if they can be developed and uh, demonstrated to be efficacious. So in terms of the online sector, I think in many ways, although we are rightly concerned about its growth, I think it's probably a better regulated sector than the terrestrial gambling sector at the moment. What has really happened is that the scandal of the casinos has, as I say, um, allowed us to lift the rock and see what's underneath. So, you know, and the gambling industry has been getting away with this stuff for a long time. And if you let people get away with stuff for a long time, they're going to get away with a lot of stuff. And the casinos, I think, have got a... Uh, a developed the mentality, particularly Crown and Star, the big ones, have developed the mentality that they can get away with whatever they like because they have been able to browbeat politicians, they have been able to capture political parties and politi politicians generally, uh, and they've been able to intimidate regulators to this point because the regulators have been subjected to not just pressure from the operators but pressure from politicians who don't want to upset the apple cart. So there's nothing like some good investigative journalism uh, 
getting attention on the front pages of the newspapers and on popular TV shows uh, to open up uh, this particular can of worms and see what's going on. And I think for many people, although I think, I think people generally turn their minds to gambling. And remember, most people don't gamble in Australia. I mean, 30% of the population, if you include people who buy lottery tickets, gamble anything at all like regularly. Um, only even in New South Wales, which is you know one of the world's centres of uh, poker machine gambling, only 19% of the population use poker machines at all. Um, in Victoria, it's less, about 15%. I mean, those people are contributing enormous amounts of money in New South Wales, seven billion dollars a year. In Victoria, probably three billion a year at current projections. Um, so they're spending a lot of money, but for the most part, most people don't think about it. it doesn't enter into their uh, consciousness, and certainly most people don't go to the casino. So when you when we see what's going on there, that they're essentially fronts for the criminal classes to launder their proceeds. Um, that is quite disturbing, I think. I think we like to think we live in a country where that sort of thing can't happen. But once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And I think that provides a great deal of impetus for public concern, which I hope can be picked up by politicians and bureaucrats and regulators. Certainly that seems to be the case at the moment. It might be they're just waiting for the storm to die down and it will be back to business as usual, but I somehow get the feeling that's not the case. I think the other interesting thing is that last time around in 2010, when it was a controversial issue, um, the media tended to swallow the PR from the uh, gambling industry. There's no question of that. I mean, this sort of nonsense about clubs being the hub of the community and providing massive community benefits and how they're not viable unless they can exploit, you know, the most vulnerable citizens in the community. They bought that stuff, including some very good journalists who should have known better. I think subsequently they realised that they'd been sold a pup, so to speak, uh, and started to rethink, but by then the caravan had moved on. But what we've got now is we've got another bite at it as a consequence of the revelations about the casinos. And indeed, the idea that, you know, whistleblowers like Troy Stoltz in New South Wales, who worked with Clubs New South Wales for a long period of time as an anti-money laundering um, officer, that in fact 95% of the clubs were not compliant with anti-money laundering counter-terrorism provisions. That was a big wake-up call for a lot of people. And I think you know, there's no reason why if you can launder money at a casino, you can't launder money at a club in New South Wales. It's a remarkably straightforward process. And uh, it's clearly happening on a big scale. So whilst, you know, the, 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 the headline news is always about money laundering, which is itself a major harm to the community because it facilitates a great deal of criminal activity. Um, but it's also linked very closely with the exploitation of very vulnerable people. So once you start thinking about that and looking at the, the nuts and bolts of it, it becomes pretty clear that this is a business which has been poorly regulated. It's got an easy run from the politicians. Uh, it's really um, been very successful in its lobbying activity. Uh, it's grown like topsy and it is almost out of control. So that, I think, has come together to produce the, uh, the perfect storm, if you like, that we see ourselves in at the moment. Thanks, Charles. So we've got a question here, but I think it's part of a broader question around, um, as you said, in terms of the Finkelstein Review, there's a whole range of recommendations, including sort of a need to sort of think about, um, even though it, was, it wasn't under the remit in terms of um, reducing gambling harm, particularly thinking about um, treatment as well. I mean, what's your sense around what we're likely to see in Victoria? And, you know, will it include expanded treatment op options would include that uh, you know what, what do you think what, what, what's on the uh what, what do you think it's going to look like well if they let me design it it would include considerably improved treatment options um but i think the other the thing that we haven't done much of i mean a treatment on the treatment side i know it's underfunded and inaccessible to many people not well promoted in some cases and not accessed by very many of the people who might derive significant benefit from it. So we need to get better at that, no question. And that needs more money and better promotion and all the rest of it. But the other thing we haven't done really is any measure of prevention. Um, you know, the, the best examples <clears throat> that we could see from, um, you know, the history of tobacco control or motor vehicle interventions to produce accident have simply not been implemented. So whilst I strongly support increased resources for treatment, and I we think that any reasonable response to this should include those. Um, we need to implement the sort of reforms that will uh, 
stop harm in the first place. And that includes things like pre-commitment systems that people can use to manage their gambling better. The industry talks about it as being a terribly negative thing, but in fact, if you give people a pre-commitment tool, it allows them to manage their gambling. Now, not everyone's going to manage it well, but some people will. And I think, you know, I've spoken, as you have, Dan, to many, many people affected by gambling addiction. Uh, and many of them have said to me that it would have been very helpful for them to be able to set a limit and be held to that limit. It would be very helpful for many people who decide they don't want to gamble anymore to simply pre-commit to not gambling anymore and have that effectively enforced. Now, a pre-commitment system can do that. Um, at the moment, the self-exclusion systems are largely a joke. I'm not saying they don't help some people, but they're certainly not enforced well and they're much more honoured in the breach than in the observance. So, I, you know, I mean, if we, if we are going to respond to this properly, then, you know, what we've been doing so far is simply inadequate at every level. It's inadequate at the treatment level so far. It's been adequate at the prevention level. It's inadequate at the public education level. It's inadequate at the enforcement level. And it has been inadequate at the regulatory level. So if we want to get it under control, then we have to allocate more resources at every of those levels, at each of those levels. Some of them will cost more than others, but if we are serious about reducing the very avoidable harms of gambling addiction, uh, then we know exactly what to do. And I'm sure, you know, you and me and a few other people could sit around and come up with a really beautiful plan for it. It would cost a lot of money, um, but we've got the ideas and we've got the, um, the interventions developed and we know how to do it. It's just that we need the political will. That's, that's what's really been lacking in this whole field up to this point, in my opinion. I just want to draw this question here and just drawing on earth themes. I mean, more recently, just in terms of other, um, I suppose, other support for gambling reform, um, we've seen a number of sort of local councils, for example, now uh, choosing to, to say that if you want to use our sporting fields or our facilities, you can't promote any sort of connection to any sort of pokies venue. Or So what do you think about the role of, the local community. I mean, you've talked a lot about how, you know, and you've written a lot in the past around how um, the, I suppose, the, the, the local venues sort of claim how much they're helping the community by basically sucking money out of the community and taking and moving it elsewhere. And so what, what do you think about these local responses and the royal councils and where, where do you see that going? Oh, yeah, no, look, that's, that's all very important. I mean, one of the problems with... Um, you know, trying to reform the gambling sector, particularly the local gambling sector venues based in the community, is that they, you know, when, when the going gets tough, they always wheel out the Galarganbone Cricket Club um, or something like that, which is the only social amenity in that town, you know, for hundreds of kilometres. And, you know, if we introduce self-exclusion, they won't have any money and they won't be able to run their fundraisers and they won't be able to give money to the cricket team and all the rest of it. And, you know, I guess there may be some merit in that, but if you look at on in the big picture, in Victoria, uh, where we have reasonably good records about their community benefits system, um, the clubs get an 8.3% tax break, provided they can demonstrate that they've allocated an equivalent amount uh, to community benefits. But once you analyse it, you see that 75%, consistently 75% of that community benefit is claimed as their own operating expenses. Um, in actuality, they give about 2% of their pokey revenue to anything approximating community resources. In the case of one football club, they were essentially uh, um, strip mining local communities 40 kilometres away in the western suburbs of Melbourne and using that money to uh, provide first class training facilities for their AFL players. Now, you know, that may be a benefit uh, to the community if you happen to barrack for that football team, although it's not a very real one. Um, but it's certainly no benefit to the people who are pouring their money into the poker machines in that far western suburb. Now, you know, one of the good things about the revelations um, that this sort of research has opened up is that clubs like Geelong, the Melbourne Football Club, Collingwood even, have ditched their poker machine business. They've sold them on. Now, they've sold them on because of a lot of reasons, but one of them is that the reputational damage that they now perceive as being associated with that is so great that it's not worth their while to continue. Even though it's a very lucrative stream of money and all the rest of it, the reality is that um, it's just not worth their time to do it. It damages them far more than the revenue benefits them. 
And I think that's an interesting message. I mean, these are hard-headed business people running these clubs. They're not softies like me. They're not worried about, you know, offending people's feelings. They are concerned about how they're perceived in the community. So that reflects a very important development in community perceptions, I think. Um, the VRGF has, of course, provided some funding to clubs to buy out their bookie sponsorship. It's important to remember the bookies don't give them vast sums of money. I mean, the real, the real reason that the, the, the AFL continue to support the bookmakers is because it bids up their broadcast rights. And, you know, so there's this sort of web of tangled interest involving the AFL, the broadcast rights, the broadcasters and so on, uh, so that they can continue to bid fairly ridiculous amounts to purchase the broadcast streaming rights for <coughs> football. But, you know, there's no particular reason why some other set of businesses couldn't equally be interested in sponsoring football. And I think what we're seeing now is more pressure on the, on the AFL from the clubs and the players, in fact. Many of the players have been putting pressure on the AFL to get out of gambling altogether because they see it as being absolutely uh, contrary to the avowed purpose of the code, which is to promote, you know, healthy activity and family values and so on. So I think the community has a really important role to play in making sure that community assets are not used to promote harmful gambling activities, just as they would have been, you know, 30 or 40 years ago in making sure that their premises were not used to promote smoking. And, you know, I remember, I'm sure you remember that, you know, the, the, one of the first solid steps towards limiting the consumption of tobacco in Australia came when sporting sponsorship um, was removed from the tobacco business. Um, you know, the Fitzroy Footy Club, I think, used to be sponsored by Winfield. The Rugby League Cup in New South Wales is sponsored by Winfield. Removing those associations goes a long way towards delegitimising, denormalising these activities. And the place for that to occur is, of course, with the, uh, with the community. It's a community level where it matters and where it happens. So local governments who want to take up this mantle, you know, absolutely support that 100%. Fascinating, Charles. Uh, another question I've got in here, and I, I, I might just adapt it slightly. The question here is around pre-commitment and sort of how that's going to work in the online gambling space, particularly obviously yep. when there's multiple sites. But uh, just to extend that question, so if you can answer that question, but also just this sort of what we've talked about is a lot of the work you're talking about is happening in individual jurisdictions. So what, what's the role federally then? So what's the federal role in all of this and, and how do we... You know, what, what you're thinking around how we have a much more coordinated response across it all? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think we probably need to um, pressure the federal government to take a more leading role in this. One of the interesting things about the consumer protection framework for online gambling was <clears throat> it was developed by the last government following a review by Barry O'Farrell. You know, Mr. O'Farrell, um, when he started the review, he was told that the principal interest in it was illegal offshore wagering, that there was this huge problem with people going offshore and wagering on unlicensed sites, you know, using Australian money to, um, you know, credit cards to, to gamble on, you know, internet casinos and things like that. And that certainly occurs and it's a problem, no question. But what um, he discovered once he started digging and listening to what people had to say was that the biggest um, problems were actually associated with licensed operators on shore. And so, you know, although he, he, he certainly addressed himself to these offshore providers, the main thrust of his recommendations went to the development of a consumer protection framework, which to their credit, the previous government did in fact start to implement. So that meant, you know, banning um, lines of credit, um, reducing the possibility for people to be incentivized into opening um, betting accounts and all the rest of it. Um, and what we've seen has the, been almost bipartisan support for that. Now, the problem in Australia is, although there's no doubt that the federal government has absolute control over online gambling and almost certainly can regulate terrestrial gambling if it wants to, um, they don't want to. It's too much of a problem. So at the practice at the moment is that all the bookies and all the other operators are licensed at a state level. The Commonwealth has some enabling legislation, the uh, Interactive Gambling Act, which provides for the framework in which regulation occurs. And because of that, the Commonwealth had a little bit of leverage with the states and managed to drag them together uh, to get the consumer framework implemented around the country. 
So that level of cooperation and coordination was very significant in bringing about a uniform consumer protection framework. And I think it's been reasonably successful so far and there's likely to be more successful in future as different initiatives are implemented. So when we're looking at a pre-commitment system, at the moment, there is a pre-commitment system, but it's a voluntary opt-out system. So that means you are required to set a limit or to opt out of the system, but you don't have to obviously um, uh, do that if it's a voluntary opt-out system. That could easily become a universal system. That is, you must set a limit uh, and you must stick to that limit. And that applies across the board. So each of the operators at the moment runs their own system, but as we're finding with the bet stop um, facility, that's actually a third party providing that. And it's modelled on a British system. So you could also readily develop a pre-commitment system that operates across the entire sector. So even if you put, you know, if you've got a limit of $100 a day and you bet $50 on operator A and then try and bet $100 on operator B, uh, the system should be able to pick that up and tell you you can't do that. You've got to cut your betting down. That's not particularly difficult. It requires, you know, coordination between the states. It requires coordination between the operators, but that is perfectly achievable. And, you know, in many ways, online gambling is much easier to operate with because it's entirely digital. Everything that happens on it is happens inside computer space. Terrestrial gambling, um, you know, it looks like it's quite a difficult task, but essentially what we're talking about is a bunch of computers talking to each other with poker machine gambling, and indeed even with uh, these days with casino type gambling or lotteries or Kino or whatever you like, it's all digitized. So the, as in Norway, um, it would be feasible to introduce a system which operated across all gambling modes if you wanted to. It would take a bit of work and a bit of networking, but it could be done. I think for the time being, what we need to do is focus on getting a universal pre-commitment system up and operating in the online gambling arena. And I think we need to support those states and jurisdictions which are moving towards a pre-commitment system at a local level. Because once we build that hardware and software, then integrating them into a truly national system will be much more straightforward. I don't think there's a lot of appetite with the federal government for them to take an active role in this. But I think we should be encouraging them to take a coordinating role in it, just as they have with the interactive gambling stuff. And I think that's perhaps the way forward at the moment, unless, you know, some as influential politician pops their head up and says, this is what we're going to do. I think we're better off taking an incremental approach and supporting them to act as coordinators for the prevention and reduction of harm. Thanks, Charles. Um, just, um, I just wondered if you could talk for a moment just um, around the, the WHO has just sort of started a whole range of work around the commercial determinants of health. I think, you know, what, what you describe, you know, and the work you've done sort of talks about vested interests around gambling but obviously the WHO has sort of coined this phrase and looked at the role of industry more broadly and its impact on health. Yeah. Maybe you could if you could say something about that but also sort of what do you think that means for sort of opportunities moving forward? Yeah so I mean you know for the, the commercial determinants has really been taking off as a concept lately and I think it's a really important one because it reminds us that you know it's not just um, people's environments that influence their health and well-being. It's, it's the power of corporations to influence their consumption patterns and their um, the way they live their lives, really. So, and that includes, you know, issues around advertising. It includes issues around corporations' ability to influence public policy. It include includes corporations' ability to, you know, get inside schools and to influence agendas in education and all the rest of it. So what we've got to start doing is looking at what this sort of commercial interest is actually interested in. It's not interested in promoting health, it's interested in maximising the return to its shareholders or its owners. And of course, that means also that the executives in those companies are interested in maximising shareholder value because they are interested in maximising their own bonuses and so on. So if we understand companies in that way and also understand them as operating within a very systemic framework, they are very good at changing their shape and changing their structure every time they encounter difficulties. And we saw that with tobacco, we're seeing it now with tobacco with their, with their uh, change towards marketing um, vaping products and so on, which is, it seems, causing considerable harm amongst some sectors of the community, particularly amongst young people. So this sort of shape-shifting 
is the capacity of the commercial operators because they have resources and the ability to constantly refine and redevelop their products and to influence public policy and to circumvent public policy where they need to. Now, we don't do that very well in public health or indeed in regulation generally. We don't have the capacity to change the shape of our responses and we need to develop that. So I think one of the key things we learned from studying the commercial determinants is the extent to which commercial forces are constantly evolving in search of enhanced profit. And if we think that it simply comes down to living in a deprived neighbourhood, which makes us more susceptible to smoking or to drinking too much or to playing the pokies, well, that's one lens with which to view it, but it's also important to look at the interests of those very large corporations in some cases that are taking advantage of disadvantage to market their products. They're not only just taking advantage of disadvantage, so to speak, but they're also taking advantage of um, political ignorance, political um, incompetence in some cases, and political influence. So, you know, the old sort of corporate political activity area has been long been an issue of interest for people studying tobacco and gambling and alcohol. But I think we need to expand that substantially and understand what is motivating corporate actors uh, to do the things they do. And it's not because they're evil, well, some of them are probably, but mainly because they're pursuing, pursuing profit. And we have to think about responding to that cleverly and adroitly with appropriate regulatory responses, which will I think allow them to make a reasonable profit, but accept that we're not interested in super profits derived from misery, which is what we're looking at in gambling and other areas at the moment. Thanks, Charles. It's almost two o'clock. I think um, we could talk forever <laughs> around this area and uh, we'd all be intrigued by um, the brilliant insights that you have in this topic. So let me just take this opportunity to thank you for giving this opportunity to, to, to learn the insights and your thoughts on, on this really evolving space. Um, so thank you for your contribute, you know, the ongoing efforts in, in terms of making the public aware of this and, uh, and supporting our political actors. And to thank the audience for taking time to come out and listen to this month's talking point. Uh, really fantastic to have Charles here. Please, um, you know, uh, check out the forthcoming calendar for future talking points. Uh, let everyone know that, about this brilliant uh, talking point today, that, uh, led by Charles, and uh, for people who've missed it, will be available, as I said, on the Turning Point website pretty soon, so please check that out, and everyone have a, a, a safe and enjoyable Christmas, and we'll see you uh, next year. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan.